Low and stable inflation is to the economy what the baseline is to reggae music. Hello students, Professor Watts here, and we are continuing with our financial history by looking at the history of central banks. Before we talk about some specific major central banks and, and their roles and functions, and this is going to be leading up into a much more detailed discussion of the Federal Reserve and the Federal Reserve's role in monetary policy in the United States, I want to look at the history to see if we can tease out some patterns. Why have central banks been created? What have they done historically? We need, want some context here for understanding why central banks exist to begin with and what they still do to this day. Because often you'll see kind of a, a lack of attention or even a disconnect between the history of central banks and their current role, which I think is unfortunate because this history really informs what central banks are there for and it's still very relevant today in assessing what they do. So in studying this, I've teased out some main patterns that I want us to observe. Three different kind of formulas for the development of central banks historically. And this really goes back only about 400 years or so. The earliest central bank started in the 1600s. So there's not a tremendous amount of history, but there's there's enough you know, to, to see some patterns. Okay, so what I call pattern one is a central bank that begins life as a government sponsored or government chartered bank and government is the primary customer so it's a bank that's created by government for government to help the government with its fiscal needs right the, the government needs money historically primarily to wage wars more recently there's war or defense and then also public policy type um, needs for money and this is a pretty prevalent theme government will give this kind of bank a monopoly of banknote issuance in exchange for commitments to lend funds to the government. And that is a pattern seen most starkly with the Bank of England, which I'll give a few more details on here momentarily, in the late 1600s, and then also the Bank of France in the early 1800s. So that's pattern one. Pattern two, which is also fairly common, is that the government takes over a pre-existing commercial bank and kind of turns it into a central bank and often provides some impetus or incentives for that bank to then lend money on very easy terms to the government. So kind of the same purpose of fiscal helper, I, I'll use the term fiscal helper a lot, which is where the, the central bank commits to lend money to the government or to buy the government's bonds, which is the same thing, or ultimately to monetize the government's debt, which we'll talk about later on. So we saw this with some other early central banks in the 1600s in uh, Amsterdam and the Netherlands, and then also Sweden. Okay, then finally, and this is a little bit more modern, we have the banker's bank model, which is the lender of last resort, where the banking system uh, often will ask for a central bank or the government will create a central bank under the guise of helping out the banking system. And then that system can evolve over time into the fiscal helper role, lending money to the government, buying government bonds, monetizing government debt. This is seen most prevalently with the Federal Reserve. And as we'll start to mention, the term lender of last resort is very relevant here. The uh, central bank is a institution that will provide funds, liquidity to the um, banking system in times of crisis or panic or li liquidity problems. Then it also becomes a lender of last resort to the government, usually soon thereafter. Um, macroeconomic stabilization is often explicitly part of the role of these banks. And you'll see this is a more modern concept. Uh, banks that were established in the 20th century usually had macroeconomic stabilization kind of explicitly built into the role of the central banks. The earlier wave of central banks, going back to the Bank of England or uh, Bank of France, they were explicitly to help the government fund its spending. And then they usually evolved into the macroeconomic stabilization role because they ultimately would acquire a monopoly of the money supply. And as we know, if you have a monopoly of the money supply, well, you better care about the macroeconomic effects because too much money issuance will be inflationary and destabilizing and too little money issuance or money creation could be deflationary and destabilizing. So we have that classic kind of Goldilocks situation. Got to get that money supply growth rate just right. Uh, my porridge is too hot. Uh, my soup's too hot. 
Okay, so let's take a brief look at some of the most historic central banks, and we'll start with the what's generally viewed as the first uh, central banking entity, although it wasn't founded as a central bank. It was founded as a basically a commercial bank. It's technically a merchant's clearinghouse that was initially not really a bank in the sense we know it as a fractional reserve lending institution, but it was more just a, a warehouse entity that uh, stored merchants' money. Better to have that centrally stored where it was safe, secure, and then you could draw bills on the on the gold coin stored in the vaults rather than hauling around sacks of gold coin yourself. It's more secure, more convenient. Well, uh, this uh, banking also started this way in, in England and other places in the world historically. The, the gold warehouses realized, well, we've got all this money on deposit. Most of it's just sitting idle so we can lend it out. And so that's how you see banking evolve uh, historically, including in Amsterdam. They pioneered bank money, or what we call inside money in the economic lingo, which is where the bank can issue notes that, are, as we've seen, are basically just promises to pay the underlying money, which was usually gold coin or silver coin. Okay, so bank notes um, start to emerge here and become pretty commonplace in the commercial centers of the world. And then, as I mentioned, that evolves into a lending institution, a bank as we know it, that takes deposits, usually from businesses, merchants, and then with the idle money sitting in the vaults, they can start making loans to other people, extending credit to depositors who overdraw is how this begins. And then they start lending to businesses uh, or governments like the city of Amsterdam, the Dutch East India Company. And the thing that makes this a central bank, the reason why we've categorized this is because, well, they are starting to lend to the government. So the government will eventually kind of uh, formalize this institution as the central bank for the Netherlands. So this would be a pattern two central bank. Swedish Royal Bank is next in the later 1600s. There was a bank called the Stockholm's Banco, and they issued what were known as the first real banknotes in Europe in the uh, mid 1600s. And you can see a picture of one of them here, which is a, a pay, payable to bearer banknote. So Right? Is it money? Well, it serves as money, but remember, it's really a claim on the ultimate money, which would have been gold coins. Or I think in the case of Sweden, they actually had a copper standard, so huge copper coins, because copper is a more common metal than gold. So to have the same value as a small gold coin, you'd have to have a large copper coin, which would be inconvenient to carry around. So it's natural to use banknotes as a substitute for those copper coins. They were issued via loans, so banks would lend out these notes into existence, creating deposit accounts for their customers, as we've seen when we look at bank balance sheets and how banking operations work. We've actually kind of looked at that already. As I mentioned, substituted for the heavy copper coins, redeemable on demand. And they did extensive lending, lending especially to their government, which again, you can see that fiscal role very early in the uh, development of central banking. Now, lending too much to the government can lead to inflation. And that's what happened with the uh, Stockholm's Banco. And that's what led to a collapse and a government takeover. So this was technically the world's first central bank as of the government takeover, which made it the Swedish Royal Bank or the Riksbank in 1668. And as we can see, there were some um, further developments. Monopoly of note issue is a common theme. It actually took surprisingly long for the Swedish Royal Bank. Other uh, central banks usually got their monopoly of banknote issue very early on, as we'll see. Interesting fact about the Swedish Royal Bank, they are the entity the, that awards the Nobel Prize in Economics, which started in 1968. The Nobel Prizes in uh, all the other disciplines that you've heard about, like chemistry, and physics, medicine, the Nobel Peace Prize, those started um, back in the early 1900s. Um, that were created by Alfred Nobel himself, but the economics one, which is not part of the other Nobel Prizes, is uh, was launched by the Swedish Royal Bank. Okay, the Bank of England, probably the best known historic central bank, started in 1694, and this was a pattern one bank, established as a bank for the government of England, for the crown. And it was given exclusive privilege of note issuance, at least for larger banking entities, so it had a de facto monopoly on banknotes in England in return for loaning 1.2 million pounds to the king in order to rebuild the Royal Navy so England could continue with the fighting these uh, chronic wars with France, which of course England is going to be at war with France for uh, much of the next you know 100 plus years, all the way up to the Napoleonic Wars in the early 1800s.
And 1.2 million pounds was a lot of money in 1694. Now, a couple of quick historic facts. Uh, the Bank of England suspended specie payments for a, for a protracted period during the Napoleonic Wars, about a, a 20 plus year period. So that means the bank notes were the only form of money. You couldn't go redeem those for pound sterling, which you could have gotten silver or gold at that time. And then in 1844, they get the, the official legal monopoly, although they had kind of a practical monopoly on banknote issuance. It's made legal in 1844 for uh, England and Wales. Scotland, interestingly, had its own free banking system where privately chartered banks could continue to issue notes. So there's, a, there's an interesting contrast between the monopolized um, central banking system in England and Wales versus the free banking system of Scotland, which continued, I think, for another several decades. Bank of England is pretty well known for uh, be having the first kind of self-conscious lender of last resort role in response to a financial panic that occurred there in 1866. And um, when you study the works of Walter Badgett, who was the founder of The Economist, um, the, you know, one of the leading financial newspapers in the world, which started off in, I believe, in the 1840s. And Badgett was a very keen observer of the Bank of England, and he will talk about him more later on in terms of um, kind of formulating central banking practice and the idea of lender of last resort. So this was put into practice uh, in the mid-1800s here for the first time in, in an explicit way, in kind of a public policy type of manner. Britain will go off the gold standard uh, permanently in 1931 in the midst of the Great Depression. And the U.S. is also going to follow suit here. So then Bank of England notes become the only currency the, or the, the principal currency. They're not just now a claim on money. They are the money itself. That's the, the debasement process, which we'll also talk a little bit more about. And in the post-World War I era, because Britain had uh, massively overextended um, its spending and, and suspended the gold standard, it kind of became incumbent on the Bank of England to engage in monetary policy, managing money supply and money supply growth for macroeconomic ends. Bank of England gains independence over monetary policy not until 1998, which is kind of interesting because central bank independence is a pretty big deal. And with other central banks, that was built in at the beginning. So you can see that with the Fed and with some other uh, more modern national central banks. Uh, with the Bank of England, they weren't fully legally independent of the rest of the government until not that long ago. Interesting fact about the Bank of England, you could have commercial accounts there up until the 1940s. So it was a central bank, a government's bank, but it was also a commercial bank. So businesses could have accounts and you know draw, write checks on their accounts and, and utilize banking services from the Bank of England, borrow money. And that's pretty uncommon for central banks. Like the Federal Reserve, you probably know, is just a banker's bank and the government's bank. All right, the Bank of France, similar to the Bank of England, founded by Napoleon in 1800, in the aftermath of the French Revolution. And why do you think Napoleon founded a government bank? Well, because he was at war with most of Europe and he needed money. So this is a classic pattern one bank where the government establishes the bank, gives them some privileges, and then is dependent on them for a source of, lo of loans. Right. So similar pattern here. They gave a group of Swiss bankers exclusive banking privileges, large source of credit of funds for Napoleon's government, and then uh, as we've seen, they get the exclusive right to issue banknotes, first in Paris, and then that's going to expand to the rest of the country. Um, Bank of France notes granted legal tender status. That's also pretty important because then you can go off of specie and force the acceptance of paper money. Complete banknote monopoly for all of France comes in 1848. Interesting fact about the Bank of France, I, I did not know before I was uh, preparing this lecture. It's still a commercial bank where average citizens can open an account. So this is pretty rare among central banks. You can go and have an account. Just, you know, Joe Q Citizen here can open an account. There's a Bank of France ATM. So you can go slide your ATM card in there and, and get your bank notes directly from the source. Okay, now the Fed. We'll be talking a lot more about the Fed. So just briefly here, because I'll go into these details again. The Fed is established in 1913, which is pretty late among major world powers to launch a central bank because we've seen Britain has already had one for you know 200 plus years at this time. France has already had it for 100 years. And the Fed is also kind of unique in that it's not founded expressly for the purposes of lending money to the government. It's founded expressly for purposes of lending money to banks. So this is pattern three. This is a bank that's explicitly established to aid its own country's banking system rather than to aid its own country's government. Okay, so there's the lender of last resort function. 
And I'll talk a little bit more in the next lecture about the financial crises that engendered the Fed. But for now, I'll just summarize. We had a problem in the late 19th up until the early 20th century of inelastic currency. In other words, a supply of currency, not money per se, but currency. I'm talking about you know, banknotes, dollar bills, hand-to-hand -hand money. And it was very difficult for our banking system for institutional reasons to expand the supply of money of currency when needed. And there's a uh, pretty predictable seasonal cyclicality to this, which our banking system was hampered in meeting due to the regulatory confines of the Civil War era National Banking Acts. And I'll just briefly summarize this. This is interesting history, but I don't want to get too bogged down in it. The National Banking Acts imposed during the Civil War in 1863 and 1864 required national banks to, who had the ability to issue banknotes to buy U.S. government bonds as collateral or backing for those banknotes. And then it imposed a tax on issuance of uh, state chartered banks issuing notes. Well, the tax made it unprofitable for state chartered banks to issue notes. So only national chartered banks could issue notes now. And that was, uh, re that required them buying government bonds, right? And you could probably see the logic of that. If you're the U.S. government during the Civil War, you're spending a lot of extra money and you want to kind of ensure a source of, of those funds, a, a source of lenders for those funds. So that's one reason the National Banking Act was implemented onto the U.S. banking system to ensure that banks, in order to do their function of issuing banknotes, which banks want to do and, and bank customers want to access to, well, they have to now buy government bonds and help the government finance the Civil War. So that's kind of creates this uh, symbiotic relationship, if you will, between the banking system and the government. Well, a problem with that was that the government paid down its uh, debt considerably in the post-Civil War years. The so Civil War ends in 1865 and the government cuts the size of the military down to almost nothing and then starts running surpluses and, and pays down the huge national debt that they had accumulated. Well, that makes it more, more and more difficult for banks to get their hands on government bonds because as the national debt is shrinking, there just aren't as many government bonds out there. They start to be, uh, the price starts to go up and their yield starts to decline, which makes them not that attractive of an investment. And this made it difficult for banks to grow the supply of currency that they could issue and it really hindered the ability of national banks to expand note issuance. Now, this is a problem when the economy demands more currency, such as at that time when we're still largely agricultural and cash is very important because not many people have checking accounts at this time. And of course, there's no electronic means of payment. You know, if you were a major business, you could maybe wire money from one bank to another. But the average citizen couldn't just go swipe a debit card or, you know, use Venmo or PayPal to send money to somebody. So cash was very important and it was increasingly difficult for banks to issue currency. And this caused uh, frequent liquidity crises and occasionally liquidity crises could lead to financial panics and insolvency and an economic crash. So the Fed was launched. There was a, an extensive debate about whether the U.S. should have a central bank and what it should look like that really occurred over probably about a 20 year time period in the 1890s, 1900s. And then finally, uh, Congress was able to launch the Federal Reserve as a quote, decentralized central bank. So we have the 12 regional branches, which initially were supposed to be pretty autonomous and meet the demands of banks in their local regions. And then in the next lecture, I'll talk about how that evolved to where we still have the 12 regional branches of the Federal Reserve but the power is pretty well concentrated in the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C. So we have a uh, entity that's now a central bank, and it just kind of has these 12 regional branches as an artifact of how it was initially constructed. Now, the Fed's initial job, and again, I'll talk more about this later, was to hold all the banking reserves in the country, centralize them as a base or a source to make discount loans to banks who were suffering illiquidity, banks who needed money, who needed cash, who needed currency to give to their depositors. Sometimes, you know, just on this seasonal basis, or in case of a major system-wide liquidity crisis, the Fed was there poised to issue emergency currency. Federal Reserve notes were not the main source of currency in the economy at the time. The main source of currency would have been gold and silver certificates and then national bank notes that were issued by those national banks that had been created during the Civil War.
But as I mentioned, banks had difficulty sometimes in issuing that kind of currency to meet demand, so the Fed could step into the breach during those emergencies and expand the supply of currency with Federal Reserve notes, which then would probably be retired as the demand for currency subsided. Okay, so let me just wrap up by addressing a couple other major central banks. I want to uh, include the top 10 central banks in the world by the size of their assets. So we have the Bank of Spain, which goes all the way back to 1782, pretty strictly a pattern one bank. So it was created by the King of Spain to finance, to, to loan money to the government of Spain. And then it will gradually acquire monopolies of note issuance. So kind of like a Bank of England. Uh, bank of Japan, not until 1882 with the um, reforms in Japan that kind of opened it to the rest of the world. And they said, well, we ought to have a central bank like the great European powers. As far as I can tell in my minimal research, it looks pretty much like a pattern one bank created by the government with the government as its primary customer. Bank of Italy, 1893, looks to me like a pattern two bank. It was uh, created by the government by the merger of three independent uh, pre-existing commercial banks. Swiss National Bank in 1906 looks more like a pattern three bank, more like a Federal Reserve style bank where it was created with some explicit goals of kind of stabilizing a national currency, lending money to um, to banks in the country if they or, or businesses in the country if they suffered illiquidity and uh, being a lender of last resort. Bank of Canada not established until 1934. And Canada is an interesting case study, which we'll talk about a little bit more because they had uh, something much more like a free banking system uh, in the early 1900s. And they, they suffered much, much less in terms of financial crises and bank failures uh, in the Great Depression years than the United States did. So Canada's uh, worth studying and comparing to the United States because their banking systems functioned uh, arguably much, much better than those in the United States. But nonetheless, Canada had no central bank at the beginning of the Great Depression. Uh, their financial system uh, coped pretty well, but Canada decided that they should have a central bank like other major countries, so they adopted one in 1934. Much like the Fed, where the central bank exists to be a lender of last resort and provide macroeconomic stability. China got its central bank after the Chinese communists took over in 1948. More like a pattern two, where they consolidated some privately held banks. But uh, given that China was, you know, still is, a communist country, this was much more explicitly government controlled and the credit was directed towards the benefit of the government and government owned entities. Deutsche Bundesbank, the German central bank, uh, reconstituted, uh, the allied powers reconstituted the German banking system after World War II, and they set up a pattern three, so more kind of a Federal Reserve style bank to be a lender of last resort, and it's, uh, the, the main issue of currency and, the, and a monetary policy type institution, macroeconomic stability institution, uh, as late as 1957. Brazil gets its central bank in 1964, again, pattern three, and you'll notice that mo mo most of the modern central banks, so from about 1900 up, most of them are pattern three, created to support their banking systems, centralize the issuance of currency, and uh, engage in monetary policy for purposes of macro stability. European Central Bank, similar to the, the Fed, and the unique thing here was that the European Central Bank was kind of created synthetically. There was no pre-existing monetary system here. And what happened is that the European Union got together and decided to issue a new currency, the euro, to replace all the pre-existing uh, national currencies. So the Deutsche Mark, the uh, Swiss franc, the Italian lira, you know, the, the Spanish peseta were all uh, suspended and converted into the euro. And that was a process that rolled out over several years in the late 90s, early 2000s. I can remember going to Europe in 1999 and the old national currencies were still in use, but the euro had been created and they had kind of a several year transition period where prices were quoted in both currencies. So you would have been in Germany, you could have paid in Deutschmarks, but prices were also quoted in euro and there was an exchange rate established so people could get an idea for how many euros they would have once the transition was made. I think the trans transition to euro banknotes was made in 2002, if I remember right. Okay, so there's a little history of central banks. Historically, 
I want you to note that central banks had a, a primary role of lending money to their governments and oft, oftentimes printing money for their governments. Okay. So the fiscal role, the government support role of central banks is pretty prominent. And as we'll see as we go further into details with the Fed, that is not irrelevant when assessing these more modern central banks, even though the more modern central banks have a tendency to have been created more explicitly for purposes of aiding their national banking systems and or engaging in monetary policy for the sake of trying to stabilize the economy. Now, how good of a job did they do at that? Has that been effective? Has that been functional? Well, those are the topics we'll look at in forthcoming lectures. See you soon.